Welcome to RSP Scout Talk. As always, join joining me. I'm Matt Waldman. If you, I don't even know if you don't know who I am, I don't know who I am anymore. I, I somebody called me Gray Goose today on Twitter. On Twitter, so I'm laughing there. That's my apparently my rapper name. And we have Russ Landy here. We have GM Junior. You know, or we should call him GM Senior. But like you know, <laughs> but Russ, welcome to the show. Draft is imminent. We're going to talk a good bit about uh, you know agents and scouts relationships the love of the game and a variety of other things that you know relate to the draft maybe some draft room stories we can get um you know good and bad in terms of examples of the wide range of things that happens in the nfl yeah and you know i gotta say if they don't know who you are and they're coming to watch us what are they doing (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I mean, they the came for, they came for you i mean you well, know that's if what they're I'm coming thinking. for me there are issues <laughs> <laughs> hopefully they don't come for any of us yeah, you exactly know, very they true they stay right where they are um but you know hopefully you enjoy the listening experience that we're going to have today let's just start off with I, i'm just curious because um i was contacted recently by someone who i'll just say is is technically an agent legally but they're learning about becoming an agent um, and they want to learn more about scouting. Um, and they're affiliated with a school that is, I guess, supplying NIL money and advisement to players. And, and it's going to be, a, it's a D1 school. It's a, it's a big school. And they, they asked about, you know, the relationship with, you know, they asked about scouting in general. But I'm just curious from your end, from the scouts end, what kind of relationships do scouts have with agents, if at all? Because all I see in the media is agents wanting to do kind of the idea of what corporate media managers want to do with media, which is kind of do their version of press releases and media campaigns to to get the media to pick things up and write about it and to hopefully influence people by the exposure to their product, and in this case, being a player. Well, firstly, what you're talking about, 100%, that's a big part of being an agent. I think the interesting thing is the agent's relationship with people with professional football teams varies. With the scouts, it's very different than the executives. With the scouts, it really starts in like June, July, because that's when that preseason list, the Blesto National List, comes out, and the scouts will get it on their computer. And because it is such a uh, lockdown item, as opposed to 20 years ago, all the agents who just pay scouts five or ten grand and they get their own copy. That doesn't happen as much anymore because it's so tightly controlled. So agents are constantly on the phone to scouts wanting to know what players at what schools, where are there some guys that test it out well. Additionally, you build the, the agents build the relationships so that they can call you and say, hey, I know you're watching film this summer or even during the fall. Are there any guys at these schools that are under the radar that, that agents maybe aren't chasing yet? So they build the relationships with the scouts to find out where the kids are to recruit. And of course, they're always selling their guys that they currently have or whatever. Right. But scouts don't really have a lot of influence to say, oh, this guy that's on the street, I'm going to call my boss who's going to call his boss. To... No, you're not going to yeah. get into the mix of that. Um, so they're coming to the scouts to get information about who to recruit. Then it becomes the relationship that the agents build with the directors, with the GMs, and also with the guys like Jim Nagy, Eric Galco, to get their guys exposure enough to get invited to the big all-star games, to ensure they go to the combine. Um, So agents, the good ones, are always working every angle because it's not that teams will draft a player or advocate for a player to go to an all-star game just because of an agent. But if an agent does his job correctly, that player's name will be a player that that executive thinks about and at least pulls up his information on the computer, reviews what they may have on him. And also he may tell the agent, hey, you know, we're not really high on him. Here's the three things we think he needs to focus on this spring leading up to his pro day. And that's one of the things that agents can really get great feedback once they've developed relationships with front office people and even with scouts is, hey, when the season ends in December, what does he have to work on in those three months for the combine or for the pro day? But it's a weird relationship. I used to get calls all the time. I was driving around the Midwest with the Browns, agents calling, hey, I heard you're going to the Kansas schools this week. Are there any players at those schools I should be recruiting? And you always got to stay away from that because if it's unless it's someone you really know and trust, 
information you give could come back to burn you because it may be someone that's calling around on behalf of an executive with a team to find out which scouts are sharing information and things like that. That's interesting. That's a, and that's very insightful. Um, yeah, because from the, from the plain side, I can see how that's, um, that would be worthwhile for the agents, but from the scouting standpoint, yeah, you have to be careful. You have to be careful of what you provide and what's too much information and what's, and what's really going to be helpful to build a good relationship. That's a, a workable one. Yeah, and I, and I will add the one benefit that you can get through this is in August, September, when you're going to schools, if you see a kid at, say, you're at Kansas State, and you think, God, this kid's really a fringe guy. I don't, I'm not sure he's not getting drafted, but I'm pretty sure. But I really like him as a guy that I'd love to get as an undrafted guy. You can contact the kid, start building that relationship, and then once the agent gets him and locks in, then you start talking to the agent too and selling him on how much you believe in the kid, how great a fit you think he'd be, and you're going to try to get him drafted even if you know you're not going to be able to. You say you are. And to work that relationship, because there's no doubt that if you get a relationship with the kid and with the agent, you have a chance of winning that recruiting battle for an undrafted guy over teams that may offer more money. Okay. So you may offer 5000 or 4500 signing bonus. They may offer ten, but because you've built a relationship over six months and know the agent and everything, the kid's agent may say, you know what, I know Indianapolis may sound better because of the money, but Pittsburgh here... We trust Russ. We believe what he's telling us about where he's going to fit. We're going to go with that. So there is a value for the scouts to build those relationships with agents because if you build a trusting relationship over years where no one lies or burns each other, there will be benefits of sometimes getting a guy to come to your team when the money's equal. And we're not talking like the huge money unrestricted free agents. That's going to be money. That, right. that, 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 those are millions of dollars, but when the difference is five or ten thousand on an undrafted guy, yeah, that's where an agent can influence it and say, "Hey, I trust Russ more than I do these other teams. I'd rather him go somewhere where I know a scout that's going to really fight for this kid." That makes sense. That makes sense. So, what about just draft with the draft coming up? What? are some let's call it the good and bad and the ugly of like draft room stories i'd love to hear any you know anything that you would either say in general or if you can give specifics about some draft room stories that either you've been privy to or have heard about from people you trust who are who've been cohorts in industry where you go okay What's a good example? Like I've heard that Pittsburgh is a great example of a draft room where if the if say the GM and the and the and the scouting director or and the coach aren't all in agreement on a player that maybe you'll see Rooney come in and break a tie. Um but that but I've also heard stories of like, you know, um the Bud Adams story in you know back in the day with jeff fisher and the scouts wanting jay cutler and the uh and, and norm chow coming in and wanting matt liner um and then you know bud adams coming in and saying i just got booted out of houston i want to flip the bird and get vince young you know to all the houston population and take their guy um and seeing things like that and then also there's the infamous you know there's the infamous story that that circulated, and I don't know whether it was true, but the infamous story about Matt Millen, who was a great, great linebacker and great, great guy. But the talk about having a relative in the Detroit Lions draft room who during on like day two or day three, early day three, Matt Millen's asking for some names and the nephew, the nephew spurts out a name who's not working with the team. He's just there in the room and he takes that over scouts and it turns out to be a dog of not a dog of a player in a good way a dog in a sorrowful way and you know i've heard stories like that those are examples of good bad and ugly that i've heard yeah and i will say the funny thing is i think if you talk to anybody that was in detroit with matt i don't think anybody would question matt's knowledge of football yeah. matt's ability to scout and evaluate i think it really comes down to being put in a position where if you don't know how a team 
builds a draft board and haven't experienced it, it's very hard for you to step in at the top level without at least seeing how that's done a few years and be effective. I would bet now if Matt was given that chance again, he would probably be a very successful GM. I think he'd you know kill I mean? it because no yeah. GM seemed to get a second opportunity. Very, very rare do guys get a second chance, um, especially when you look at guys, some of whom who had instances of success, like a Thomas Dimitrov or a Jerry Reese. I mean, these guys both, Jerry won two Super Bowls. Thomas went to a Super Bowl and obviously infamously lost it. But if you look at those two guys, if you don't think they would have learned from the issues that caused them to be fired and be extremely, if not more successful than they were before, I can't envision how they wouldn't. So, yeah, there's no doubt. Um, It's one of the weird things. Um, Retread head coaches, no problem. But retread general managers, you almost never see. Um, And that's why I've never had an issue if if a guy gets a GM's job, if he gets rid of some good people in the front office to bring in his people, because the odds are this is your one chance you're ever going to have. Yeah. So you may as well not hope that some of these people that are there that you don't know work out or won't stab you in the back, bring in people you know and trust. Yeah. It's not that they're better, but if you only get one shot, you want to be surrounded by your people that you trust because you never know how it's going to go otherwise. Um, in terms of the stories, you know, I may have told this one before. I don't remember when we started doing this, but I still remember to this day, this is one of the weirdest things that ever happened because in the NFL, you're supposed to have your draft board pretty well set on draft day so that there maybe occasionally there'll be a debate about players. But in general, that stuff's supposed to be resolved. You're supposed to have gone through every potential two-person tiebreaker and separated it so you know. And I remember at the Browns, and I won't use the players' names because I don't think it's appropriate, but I still remember being in the draft room and our second round pick was up and we were on the phone with a particular player and we were basically, we had committed, we said, this is our guy. And I remember we, we said, somebody said, okay, put that, put him on hold or, or someone take the call like outside of the room. And the person in charge literally turned to the scouts because it was only the scouts and we would bring in generally the coordinator on the side of the ball we were debating. Um, And in this case, you just turn to the scouts and said, is there anybody here on the board within range that you would take over this kid? And one of the scouts said, yeah, I'd take this kid over that guy. And all of a sudden, and he said, why? And he explained why. And all of a sudden, a player that was probably 25 or 30 spots below that player on our board, all of a sudden, that guy was now our selection. And we literally told the other kid, we're going to call you back. We drafted the kid that this scout had recommended. Now, luckily, when our pick came up in the third round, no one had taken the guy we'd been on the phone with, and we took that guy. Wow. And we got very lucky because the guy we took, that we oddly took, was a marginal backup, rotational, returner, receiver who never really found a home. The other guy, although he never became a star, I think he had four or five years as a starting center in the league. Mm -hmm. So... That's one of the ones I always look at and think we're putting all this time and all this energy and all these different opinions, having meetings, watching film, Wonderlick, the combine, the interviews, the psychological tests, everything under the sun. And the day of, we're just saying, does anybody like this guy more? It's like, wait a second. I mean, it's just like, are, it just, it seems like, wait, what are we doing? It's like, but it doesn't surprise me because I'll give you another one. And now this was not in the draft room on the day of the draft. This was in our final draft meetings, um, same organization, where we had gone through the running backs and we had them all ranked. And then we were getting down to the undrafted, like the guys that we would love to get as undrafted free agents. And this time again, the person in charge said, you know, I think you guys are missing on this player. Um, and and the reason it was brought up was because this the, the person in charge had been in charge of recruiting pl- at a college when this player came out of high school. So he said, well, I think you guys are missing on this kid. He was the number one or number two running back in the country coming out of high school. We're undervaluing him. And all of a sudden, this kid went from a guy we were con- we wanted to like make as one of our top undrafted guys to I think he became our number two or number three running back on the whole board. Whoa. Yeah, without discussion. He literally just picked them up and moved them. And it was like, all of a sudden, this guy went from maybe in the seventh round, if everybody's gone, we might consider, but we really want him undrafted to 
in the third round, we might take this kid. And it was like, wow. now luckily it didn't come down to that because there were some players above him in the third and in the fourth that we took. And by the time I think our pick came in the fifth or fourth, he was gone. Now, this is interesting, and I want to delve into this one real quick. Sure. Because I can understand on a certain level, like on the optics level, that's like, wow. Like, that's yes. that's crazy. And I think it is still crazy, even when you get into the minutia of it. But it does highlight something that I think listeners may not think about. And that's that... The margins between players, when we really do step outside from a broad standpoint and say, the margin between the top running back in a draft and like the 12th running back that might be taken, or even the 15th or 20th guy, isn't as big as it looks when you start defining what separates them. Yep. You know, I mean, if I change, if I change three scores on a player based on what I see, within my grading that could vault a guy up you know eight spots on my board it could i mean if i changed you know just a few things and and that's but those few things are also have like dozens of little subcategory requirements that i need to see so that therefore if i don't see all of that stuff i can't make that one change you know so there may be 20 or 30 things within those three things that all need to click together for me to make that change now that can happen if i didn't watch enough tape if i you know if i happen to see games where he was dealing with a bad ankle injury and i didn't understand that and that if i looked at the games beforehand maybe and he was healthy and he's demonstrating all those things consistently play after play that could be an example of a mistake but to just for people to understand that you move someone someone got moved up that low because he had to be you have to think there's what like probably eight to 15 running backs drafted every year Yep. So if you're thinking if you if he's a borderline free agent he had to have moved up at least a dozen spots if yeah, not at least at yeah. least 18 probably 18 or 15 18 spots. Yeah and the and the crazy part is and this is where cuz I'm a big like hey think think outside the box. I love the idea of the meetings a month before the guys saying hey here's four players we recruited out of high school that were superstars that we have really low. And we know that Russ has the Midwest, so he's already graded him. So we're not going to have Russ do it because he's already done it. He's probably a little biased. Let's have a different scout look at these three players. To me, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Because why wouldn't you want to get another opinion on a player that you personally had said was truly special coming out of high school? Yeah. But that's not the same as literally the week before the draft saying, I know we've done all this work and I know we've set the running back board, but we're yeah, going to move this guy up 12 spots. Yeah. That to me is where you go. What in the world are we doing? That's the that's the that's like the CEO of an organization asking people to do two years worth of research and work and create a project and get everything done and then present the findings and say, you know what, we're gonna do. We're gonna take a complete left here and yeah. and do this. And oh, and by the way, I'm sorry you're not getting bonuses this year because we're underperforming. Um, but how do you like this yacht that I just bought? Yeah, exactly. And showing right? it around the, you know, showing it around the, the home office, the corporate office. I mean, to me, and th and then to me, I would add on to that. I would think, okay, if say for instance, the example you used, if Russ is the guy who did the scouting, and you're like, we think he might be a little biased. I would even look at that and say, this is an opportunity for us to look at how we evaluate. So yes. let's do this as a baked in exercise every year, where we're going to pick four or five players that we really knew were awesome in high school. The, you know, Russ was the Midwest scout. Let's get another scout and let's get our head, our head guy or somebody. We'll all sit in a room. We're going to watch film. We're going to do it according to what we look at, what we say we watch and look for. And let's do it as an exercise on what we define. And if we come away with the, the purpose of this is just to see if we're all on the same page with the basic things that we want to say we define and grade and what we look for just to make sure that 
we are doing that. And if not, we can update that. And the benefit is we're going to get better with what our goals are for evaluating. If we come out of this as a, as a side benefit that, oh, we're higher on these players than we needed, that, then we should be higher on these players than we were, great. But like that to me would be how I do it because I think part of me too is just from my opinion and obviously I haven't been in a, you know, I haven't been in these rooms, but I would love to see that kind of thing because for just from an outsider's perspective, it's like, yeah, Russ may be a little biased because he's already invested in his grade knowing what it is, but let's use this as an opportunity to say, what is it that we want to define so that everyone is doing this? So if Russ, so the guy comes back and goes, well, I value this, this, and this about him. This is why. And then Russ gives a great explanation as to, well, that works. But when you're projecting to the NFL, we need to have these four or five things that we're looking for that you didn't look for here. And then that, that other scout looks at it and or the person who's in the room goes, yeah, I didn't see these things with this guy. That made, you know, so I get that. And then that, that, that G, that GM or the head of scout might be going, we dodged a bullet here, probably. You know, I'm glad Russ. You know, he's probably thinking, glad Russ brought that up. And the other guy's like, oh, I didn't even think about looking at that stuff. Yeah, these five things. Well, then the GMs or the head of scouts thinking, well, we got to make sure that all the rest of our scouts are looking at these things. Is everyone doing that? And then that way, you know, you're better off instead of. Or if the guy goes, yeah, but. I did look at these five things, but did you notice these two things? You know, I mean, these kind of conversations could be helpful. So that's that's kind of what I wanted to, to bring up and with I, them. One of the one thing I'll mention because you you talk about it that's sort of another unique story. It's not about the draft room on our day, but it was how unique when Butch Davis came to the Browns and I and I came in his I think his third year. He would build the draft board. Then he would have a board across from it as the undrafted free agent board. And then he would have a board in the back. These are basically the rejects. But he didn't want to just reject them. He said, let's at least rank them and put grades on them and discuss them. And the whole reason he did this, as he was telling us, is that he said during the first year, he was either the D-line or quality control guy in Dallas when Jimmy came in. He'd come with Jimmy to the Cowboys. And he said, because none of them had really worked in pro football at that point, he said they built their board basically, here are the guys we want, here's the guys we think it could, we could play in the NFL. So they built their board, they had all their tags up on the board, and all the boxes on the floor, they had the tags of all the guys they didn't want, the free agents. And he said, we got down, this is when there were 12 rounds, I think, or 10 rounds. He said, we get down to the eighth round, our board's empty. Wow, and he said, we're yeah. dumping the boxes yeah. out, <laughs> we're scanning through, we're throwing, trying to find names. Oh, again. that's awful. That's That's got to be like a, such a anxiety-driven moment, figuring that out. Yeah, and, and, and I give Butch credit because he said, hey, he wasn't trying to knock Jimmy because he said, I'll tell you one thing. He said, next year, he said, we had so many. He said, it was phenomenal. And he said, look, he said, we always drafted great. Yeah. He said, we killed it in the draft. But that was one of the reasons when I got, because when I'd been at the Rams, we would do our draft board and we'd have undrafted free agents more than enough to cover it. So yeah. we never ran into an issue. But this at the Browns, it was like a whole different level. We must have had probably 50 players at every position on the undrafted board and another 30 or 40 on the basically reject board that had been graded just to be prepared. And maybe it was overkill, but I just thought it was funny him telling us the story. They're literally dumping out the boxes of tags, going through them each each coach had to go get their position group, dump them out, and try to find any player they like and stick them on the bottom of the board wow. or put them on a list or something. Is is building a board just a real quick? Is yeah. Is building a board vary by team in terms of do they have? Is there are there some people who just build the board themselves after they get all the information? Are there people who say you're in charge of building our QB board, our QB section? You you're know, in charge of building by vary position a little bit, but most teams, and I think I've shown it to you, the horizontal and vertical. Yeah. Do it by position. Most teams will in. It varies, but most teams in August or July will take the Blesto National and just put the players on there just so they have a rough picture. Then in December, now some teams will, as the grades come in from their scouts, adjust it during. A lot of teams don't adjust it until the December meeting. Scouts come in, you roughly set your board based on your scouts grade and the cross check grade and just put that together. Then you really get into the nitty gritty of going through it. 
Um, it depends on the organization in terms of how the final board is set. Sometimes it's final meetings with the scouts, coaches, everybody. Other teams, it's we have our, our meetings with the scouts and the coaches in February before the combine. And then the final meeting in some buildings is the head coach, the GM, um, maybe a director of college scouting and one or two other people. And they walk position by position through the board to get it exactly how they want it. So there's no one way it's done, but there are um, sort of, I'd say the, the traditional way of everybody being involved through the final meetings is sort of the way it's done in most buildings. Are there, um, and you've talked about in the draft room, really like for scouts, the senior guys maybe speak up every once in a while, but otherwise it's, you know, generally once the board's set, you're in that draft room, unless asked directly, you're, as a scout, you're generally, is it generally? You're socializing. I mean, that's yeah. really, you're talking with the other scouts. Now, when the pick comes up, even if there's no debate, like if you're at number 17 in the second round and the pick comes up and it's it's Matt Waldman and that's the guy who it's going to be, he's the one guy remaining. Three picks before, when that when you're left, when it's Matt left and, and you're pretty sure he's going to be there, there's no doubt the GM's going to turn in and say, okay, so we're covered. This kid's a good kid. They're going to just want the last minute confirmation of, there's nothing medical. There's nothing this. And as a scout, because you're this is GM asking, a lot of time the owner's sitting in the room. You're going to flip your book open and make sure because you sure as hell aren't going to say yes and you double check. Yep, everything's good. We're good to go. And so you you won't be like arguing about players, but almost all the time before the choice, they will walk over and just confirm. Especially if there's been a discussion on character, or medical, or something, they'll discuss with you or the trainer or whatever. Hey, are we all on the same page on this one kid because of this? But yeah, generally, if you're just an area guy, you're not getting up and fighting for stuff. And the fighting is the fighting is long over by draft day. Yeah, that makes sense. It would seem, you know, it's interesting when you talk about the construction of the board, because like I, when I think about making my, my boards for the RSP, I, I tend to try very hard to like, if I were to do it for like, and this is from a very inexperienced point of view, obviously, a complete novice point of view of it. But I would, there's a part of me just from a bias standpoint, I would probably want to put like the Blesto, if I use Blesto, to put them into tiers, but not like rank them specifically. Like I would have a, I would like tear off my board almost and say, here's eight players in that tier, but I wouldn't put them, I would almost put them sideways, the name sideways maybe in the tier so that you can, and I'd say it's not in any particular order because I don't want anybody to see the order right now. I don't want yep. us to be embedded to think that Will Levis is the number one player in our top tier from August because of what a quarterback coach in the NFL that we know has been singing his praises for two years and we've been talking yes, to him. Exactly. I don't I don't care, you know. I don't want to know that. I just know that right now he's in this general area and then in December we start redoing and I'd almost maybe want an assistant like a QA assistant to be like, here's what our rankings are. Well I'm gonna for, we're gonna forget about them, but I want you to have this stuff down. Have a couple copies of this. And in December, we're going to re up, we're going to update that. And then we're going to move the tiers around, but you're going to keep the ranking, but keep that somewhere. We're not sharing that with anybody until we start getting to the refined place where now we're making those decisions. Because I don't want to, I don't want people to go, well, you move this kid up from the fourth tier up to the first tier. That's crazy. But we're doing it in like October and we really didn't look at the kid all that much yep. so if he's in the fourth tier then it's not that big of a deal he didn't really start he had two cleanup games and maybe he was maybe he was anthony richardson who you were you know who was subbing in occasionally as a gadget play quarterback you know for the starter had selected packages and this year is his first year starting and and yep. you don't want people to go oh well he's raw and you're like you just made an editorialization without really watching his film and that's yep. where I think the psychology of the board would be important. I don't know. But oh, there's the... no doubt. I mean, it's that and all. Just to give you an example, I know this is something I believe in. We did it. The Browns was when we would go on the road, we would get told what schools we're going to to cross check. Because in 
October, we'd spend three weeks on the road going to other schools in a different area to give a second opinion. As we got into September, they'd say, okay, here's the players you're looking at because they would have gotten the first set of reports. And sometimes it would only be the last week of September, first week of October, you get the names because you've already got it on your schedule. It doesn't matter when you get the names, but they would only give us the names in alpha order, name, position, jersey numbers. They didn't want to give us height, weight, speed. Not that we couldn't find that out, but they didn't want to give us grades because they wanted us going in there blind. Because if you go in there with a preconceived notion of, hey, Kevin, who I respect, and now he's the director of college scouting for the Chargers, Kevin went to Indiana and gave this kid a second round grade. Well, I'm going to go in there with the preconceived notion this kid's a pretty good player. Yeah. So we they did a really good job of that. Um, and we even as scouts, I think because we bought in, we believed in it. When we would, when I would call Kevin and be like, "Hey, I'm going to Indiana tomorrow. The, uh, I have these six guys as cross checks. Is there anybody else I should add to the list to peek at?" He would give me a name of maybe one or two others, but we never discuss what grades he gave to the players because we both, and I think all of us at the time agreed, let's not go down that road. Let's be thorough this way. It was just smarter for us. Um, I will say, just as a funny, you mentioned stories in the draft, and I still remember the Browns one year. Um, and again, I won't name the, the scouts involved, but I remember we were sitting there and the draft is unfolding. And we'd heard rumors about this player going in like the second, maybe third round. And we did not like him. We had him as a, not just not a priority free agent. We had him as a borderline, like even sign as a free agent. And I think a pick like 15 or 20 in the first round, he went. And we were all like looking at each other. And we looked at the one scout who had done that area because we didn't really dive deep on the kid because he had given him such a low grade. And we looked at him, he goes, I'm telling you, he can't play. And, <laughs> and I'm telling you, this son of a gun played about a decade. <laughs> and it was just really funny because, and it, trust me, and that's why I'm not saying names because every scout misses on guys. It's, I'm not knocking oh. the scout. I just thought it was very funny that literally this guy went, I think in the top 20, and we had him as a guy we wouldn't even want as a free agent. And we all literally were like looking at him. And he goes, I'm telling you, he can't play. And that, and, I'm, I'm telling you right now, if you could superimpose me in that in that scout's position, that would be me with Will Levis out of Kentucky. Oh, right I know. Now. Trust me. And I, it, and when I read your report on him, I was like, uh-oh, this is scary. Yeah, because I'm – because and at the same time, quarterback is one of those situations where like I can – and I can totally envision at the same time, you've got to hold – different opinions in your head about where the scenario can be. And it's like, I can totally see how he gets in the right offense. He, he works hard and he's got the physical skills to develop into that, that player, but just the way I grade. And it's about really, for me, it's about um, processing information and, and certain techniques that are easier or harder to learn. And if he doesn't have those combinations of things, then guys like Stetson Bennett and and um, Jake Hayner, who may not have Will Levis's physical skills, they're going to rank higher on my board at quarterback right now based on where my evolution of scouting is. And when I look at a guy like him, like I get it. Like I get why the NFL is going to do this. But I also get why the NFL drafted Zach Wilson and drafted Drew Locke and drafted Paxton Lynch. And, yeah. and you know, Physical for every – Every Josh Allen, there's like five of those guys, you know? So Yep. No, trust me. I mean, and I get it. I mean, especially the organizations where coaches are going to have a lot of influence, they're probably going to lean more towards the Levises because what are coaches inherently? Coaches are teachers. Yeah. And all teachers believe they can make their students better. Yeah. So they see a kid like Will Levis with – I don't know, and I like, and like I told, have said many times to a bunch of people, have asked, I've not graded these quarterbacks. Right. So when I talk about this as he seems like a guy physically in terms of arm and all that, to be on the caliber of a guy like Richardson, that they can make throws just with power and release quickness that few can. Right. And that's what gets you excited. And as a coach, if you're looking at it saying, yeah, he's maybe not polished here and here and here, but I can make him better. Yeah. And that's a co And there's nothing wrong with that. There are also coaches who have taken guys who – didn't have it all in terms of the development and the technique, but they were physically gifted and they made them better. Yeah. So there's something beautiful about that, that way of doing it to where I could see a coach driven team 
saying, yeah, we feel confident we can get Levis to be that guy, especially if they interview him, they feel comfortable with him. Everybody at the school talks about him. If they do, I have not yeah. done this research, Just but they talk about him being yeah. a worker and all those things. I could see a team saying, you know what? We love the physical skills. If we take his 25 best throws, he's right there with anybody. We feel we can fix his footwork or whatever it may be. That's where these things happen. And that's why I, I think sometimes the, the crushing of people in why people get drafted and saying it's foolish, people have no grasp of yeah. how these decisions get made. Um, and you mentioned earlier, like how close players are on the draft board. Uh, one of the things that I've always heard, and it's something that people don't seem to realize, most players that end up getting drafted in the fifth, sixth, and seventh round are third and fourth round grades on most teams boards. Yeah. Very few players get drafted that have low that have a four below a fourth round grade because a fourth round is a high end backup potential starter. Yeah. That's what most people view those bottom three rounds. Now yeah. are there some duds in there? But yeah. So the difference you're talking about seventh round or fourth round, not a huge difference there grade wise. Yeah. Yeah. It's I, I almost feel like scouting is like doing moon calculations to get to the moon. And if you're off just a little bit on something, it's like you completely miss the target. And then you have the media going, oh, how did it, how, how could you miss it? It's like right there in the sky. Exactly, like, right? you, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's like, that's kind of the, that's kind of how it feels. I think from the end of like scouting a player to what the reactions are when that player does hits and you didn't think they did would, or, you know, all those different types of, varieties of factors so how about smoke screens like you know to me it always seems to me like after the combine interviews if not a little before at that point anything i hear i'm like well it could happen but i'm not i'm not believing that i'm not taking anything to the bank that anyone's saying you know especially in the these re past two to three weeks um, you know, it, it's really funny because I've, I've spoken to people, and this isn't just when I was in with the Browns and the Rams, but I mean, even as recently as in the last two or three years, I've spoken to scouts in the league, and I remember talking to one in particular, I want to say it was two years ago, and I was like, how, how are things coming? And this is like a week or 10 days before the draft, and he was like, man, he goes, we're all set, we got the board, he's like, it's probably going to be this guy or this guy if, if things go well on the first day, and I had not been really paying attention to their team or anything, but I'd seen like hot, like uh, headlines. And I was like, really? I was like, you guys went and saw like, you sent like five or six guys and it was publicized to see like the top five guys at that position. And he's like, yeah, he goes, we're not gonna draft one of those at all. He has a zero chance. He goes, but because of the top two guys are elite players and we want them to go to push one of the two guys we want down, we felt it was worth going to make a show of it that we're interested in those guys. So, yeah. and some of it's not a show. Some of it's just, you don't know. You you set these trips that you want to go see the top players at certain positions, or you say, hey, we're going to go to Ohio State, even if we don't love Marvin Harrison Jr. We know they have nine guys that might get drafted. It's a great chance for our assistant GM to get eyes on guys. Yeah. And do things like that. So a lot of deception is out there. Um, I know when I was at the, was it the Browns? I think it was the Browns. Yeah, it was definitely, yeah, it was Butch. I remember saying it now that I think about it. I remember him saying, these are the 20 guys we have a strong interest in late in the draft or as undrafted guys. He goes, these 20 names should never be repeated outside of this room. And he then he walked over to the board of players that we had taken off our board for medical and character. And he said, you're going to be getting this list emailed to you. I want these players talked about whenever you talk to scouts or anybody outside of this room, because those are the players we want people to think we're taking. And That's they were awesome. We'd already removed from our board. That's awesome. So, and, and that makes sense because at the same time too, like you said, we just talked about building a draft board. We talked about what happens later on, how much the, the end of the draft is a big part of getting key special teams players and players who may have one or two things that we're really not sure about, but if they exceed expectations, they could wind up starting in the league for a long time, if not being stars. So why would we, with it being still fluid like that, why would we make any definitive statement or even any statement regarding these players at all when we can just say, and if someone asks us about players that we don't like, 
why not just be able to be give the non-committal or the open to you know open to the idea of these guys answer or give the show of that let the media create the smoke screen for us which i think yeah, happens exactly. a lot cuz when you think about th- even just outside of football bad things that happen or weird things that happen and somebody says i never told this reporter x y and z or i never said that they asked me this question i gave this answer but the way that they wrote it it, now everyone's presuming that I'm yep. going here or I d- was doing this or I was interested in terrorism because I brought up that I read a book about, you know, Osama bin Laden. And yep. now, you know, now they're saying, well, he has an interest in terrorism. I read one book. I didn't go to the library yep. and check out the history of terrorism. I wasn't like reading about Black September or studying this or all these different things. No, I, I read one book casually about this, and now they're saying I'm like, I have a deep and abiding interest by it. And it's going to come out in court after, you know, my lawyer shows this beyond a shadow of a doubt. But now the media forever sees me as this until maybe I suffer for the next 15 years. And maybe I go on a talk show in 20 years for them to say how I was wrongly accused of this type of thing. So it's no doubt. you play up what the media does. And I can tell you, as a member of media, you you go into certain things and, you know, someone who writes an investigative piece that's, you know, three to 5,000 words in length is going to be specific about something that some aspect of what it is you're doing. If they're writing a 500-word piece or a 1,000-word piece on you, they're doing the people magazine version and that means glossing over details it's like if someone said to you you know if someone came up to me and said you know at a party so you're an nfl scout you know um you know me being a specific person would say no i'm an independent i'm an independent scout works in the media and and then and a friend would just go, nah, you're you're an NFL scout. You scout NFL players. That's what you do, you know? Yeah. And they yeah. would keep introducing you that way. Yep. And somebody no goes, doubt. Well, what team do you work for? And it's like, no, you know, and yeah. that's the way I think the media stuff works that people know, but they don't think about and when it comes to stories being reported like this. And and I would also add in, and this this is where we talk about the deception part of it is if you think about it even with all the technological advances, even with teams like Philadelphia, Kansas City, really doing everything they can with analytics and data to improve their odds. Your odds, it's still such an art compared to a science. Your odds of being successful consistently picking players is low. Yeah. I mean, it's not low like 10%, it's above 50%, but it's still lower than you'd like it. You'd like it to be 95%. So if deception is going to help get some players you don't believe in, out of there and make sure guys that you believe in are there why wouldn't you yeah go through anything and everything to make sure as one of my first bosses told me in this business let's eliminate as many players off our board as possible because if we get every guy on our board right we don't care who else gets picked yeah because if we hit on our picks it doesn't matter and that's what i tend to think with all the misperception that you can put out there if you can trick teams into thinking you're interested in something and go get players that are good that fit your system that's what you're doing that's what you're paid for yeah because it's tough as it is i mean people you almost forget sometimes it's like you know every lots of teams want the same players you want you know so yep. you, you could you know at the same time you could say well we got players that we believe in but the first five players that you picked in this draft maybe they were your second third or fourth choice on your board each time that round came up and it's like you know think about going out to eat and thinking about the the first second or third choice and you got your fourth choice if you're like if meatloaf was your fourth choice you know every time and you're and you're sitting there going i had you know i came into this thinking i wanted a filet mignon with you know with yeah, exactly. with surf and turf and this x y and z and i got meatloaf mashed potatoes and macaroni and cheese um as your three choices and they were your four choices on your board you're probably not going to be as happy as people think and but you can't at the same time 
you can't sit there and say we only got meatloaf because no, you, know, you put it there on the board. It was one yeah. of the options. We're yeah, gonna be no. a con- we're gonna be a country kitchen this this That's year, right. and we're gonna make that the best country kitchen we can make it, as opposed to yep, you know, yeah. Being a high that's why there house. is an art to building the board and that's why and i've said this before that it's not just the best gms are not just the best evaluators. there are some really good gms who are not particularly good at evaluating and there's some great evaluating gms who are awful <laughs> as gms because they don't build the board you have yeah. to build your board and that's the and it's not just about putting names in great order it's about getting a feel for your scouts which one's always grade high? Which one's always grade low? Which coaches are good evaluators? Which ones are awful? All those different things to meld it together in a pot and put together a board and be able to hear key words when you hear a scout say one thing and be like, oh, yeah, we want that guy off our board. Forget about putting him on there. When that guy says that, that means he's going to be a problem or whatever it may be. That's why it, it's so much more than just the best player. I heard somebody in a podcast or, or an article or something this week talk about Every pick in the first round, you should be always aiming for the guys with the highest ceiling. And it's like, it's great to say that when you work in the media, but when you work for a team, there are jobs on the line. It's not fantasy football. Yeah, this isn't fantasy football. You have to look at your team and say, okay, if we take the guy with the highest ceiling, there's a good chance he's going to fail. Yes, maybe he turns into a great player, but maybe he ends up being Jade Von Clowney. Yeah. And, and do, is that what you want year in and year out is inconsistency? No. So that's what I don't think until people sit in there and trust me, I'm not trying to say there aren't many. And I think there are people like Matt that aren't in buildings and have never worked for a team that wouldn't do great and that don't understand how to evaluate talent. That's not in any way what I'm saying. All I'm saying is if you haven't sat in the room and watched a board be built, it's a little bit different than just saying, oh, here are the highest graded players. Let's stick them on the board. That's how it goes. There's so many nuanced things that go into it that until you've experienced it, it's hard to really wrap your head around the whole picture. I don't understand how anyone who comes from the outside world would go into a GM job immediately and thrive because you have to, you would have to be someone who, you have to be in a, what you just described, you have to be a tremendous listener. Mm -hmm. You have to have, a really good uh, emotional intelligence to pick out what is important and what isn't. You'd have to, because you have to know when people are bullshitting or when people are afraid or when people are leading with their ego and have to, and then who to trust again, because people are gunning for your job and people are talking in back channels and they're going to, they're going to create little cultures because people do this at work and that's like you said pointing out that you want to bring in your guys that you trust and how do you do that if you're an outsider coming in like you've got you know the idea because of... remember the guys if you're on the out and i don't mean to interrupt yeah, please but think about it if you're mike mayock or matt millen you're on the outside the guys you know that may be your guys that are working for teams you've never worked with them that's right so they're your friends when you hang out and have a beer yeah but you don't know what they're like in a building. That's right. So you don't know, are they the type of teammate who's going to have your back? Or are they the type of teammate who's always going to be going to the media saying, yeah, we didn't want him. He did. Yeah. So, or, and the other thing is to yeah. be in that position, you have to have no ego. Yes. To be a great GM, you have to be willing to say, you know what? I didn't like him, but everybody else seems to like this guy. I may have to put him higher than I like Yeah. because I trust the process. Yeah. You would have to be in this day and age and it's much harder now than it was say in al davis or george hallis's time you would have to be an un you'd have to be an amazing innovator who came up with something that completely changes the game and strategy of how you would build a board and evaluate players to just come in off the street and revolutionize your team and have a distinct advantage I think to even be able to do it at a at, at an average rate, you would have to be rare. Yeah. Because yeah. that's why when I look at guys like Andrew Barry or Quasi with, with Minnesota, these are guys who have a lot of those traits of intelligence that you say they probably could jump in at the top level. But I think the reason that they're both doing well now and I think going to be successful over the long term is they came in and learned 
yeah. what works because you just it, there's so many things you don't even think of that come into play when you're evaluating when you're having meetings when you're discussing players and it's something we've talked about a lot it's just there's so many things you don't even know it's not that you're not smart and it's not that you don't work hard it's just it's a lack of knowledge it's ignorance yeah and and it's not to be mean it's just People who haven't worked in the business, they don't understand what actually goes on. Yeah, ignorance is not a bad thing. It's a no. neutral thing. It's just a Admitting state of it being. Key. Yes. Admitting it is key because, man, I mean, like, it's enough. Just think about being a scout, like being new as a scout. You know, besides studying players and knowing the position, you got to understand how to fill out the reports they want you to fill out. You have to... You have to understand how to be a good traveler. Like, so like where you're going to stay, what's going to be the most efficient way for you to go where you need to go, get what you need to do, maximize your time, you know, be and just how the logistic you for you? It. Yeah. Because every scout's different. Yeah. Certain guys flourish in certain ways. Yeah. So you it's might, so hard. Yeah. You might not, you might not be able to go eat, eat fast food like eight day, you know, Eight, eight meals a week and like actually function well enough to do your job. You might realize I got to find out beforehand where all the natural food grocery stores are, what, what I'm going to, what I can eat on the road and pick my spots doing these things. Otherwise I'm going to be laid up and I'm not going to be able to get my work done. Or I'm not going to feel good and I'm going to get behind and I'm going to have, I mean like what's my workout routine. I mean, just silly things like things that seem silly or extraneous to the actual job. But the same thing with being a GM. How is, how are you going to do your day-to-day? -day? Because you're handling fires at every moment. Everything's yep. the number one priority for that person coming to talk to you. And it might be the 18th priority for you. But you've got to treat it yep. like it's number one. Well, one of the things that I've heard a lot when you talk to people who worked with, with GMs who stepped in without experience is, they felt that the biggest thing they had to do was was watch film. Just watch film, evaluate, watch film, evaluate, and that'll get it right. And it's great to do that. But if you talk to the guys that have been successful, whether whether it's a Chris Ballard for so many years or Howie Roseman or, or, or even uh, John Spanos out in San Diego, a big part of overseeing it is, yes, you're going to grade players. There's no doubt. But you're going to manage the department, manage the people, ma make sure the flow of information gets to the point where it puts together your board. Yeah. And I think those are the things that, that if you come in off the street, you've never seen it the first year or two, you're sitting there and it's like, you're, it's like the, the whole scouting process is Chinese yeah. and you yeah. don't know how to speak Mandarin. Yeah. And, and that's all it is. Like we said, it's not a lack of intelligence, not a lack of work ethic or even scouting ability. It's just, you're trying to do something you've never done. You would never put somebody behind the wheel of a car and say, all right, day one, go race in the race. Yeah. Go drive in Atlanta. Go drive in Atlanta first day ever. No, yeah. you want them to get used to it. And that, to me, is where you run into problems. Now, obviously, a guy like John Lynch has been successful, but I think a lot of that success has been the fact that he is a guy like Kyle Shanahan sort of managing and overseeing and making final decisions, and it works well together because Kyle was influential in getting John hired there. Yeah. Um, but I think oftentimes if you put a guy in charge who's never – been in the business it's really unlikely to succeed yeah so let's talk about something new that seems to be popping up in the nfl that we've heard a lot more about in the media and they've been it's been a little bit more um it's been around for i think a number of years but it's starting to make way which is s2 the cognition test on processing like i'm not I'm, I think just personally, I'm, I think that the fact that they want to study processing speed is a step in the right direction, No and, doubt. you know, and that now it's putting Wonderlick in its place. Like to me, Wonderlick has it, you know, I like to we joke it has no value. Yeah. We talked about all that, but it, there's a value to rote memory. There's a value to studying to a certain degree, but this is, this is a different avenue that, I think people sometimes misplace with Wonderlick that S2 is trying to step in the right direction to study processing speed. But from a standpoint of being, uh, you, you know, in personnel management, in, you know, team development, player personnel development, when you're looking at something new like this, I mean, 
where do you where do you put it in perspective now that it's like say it's two or three years old or four or five years old but there's not a lot of data of success or failure we're hearing about in the media like is this you know it almost the media almost like makes it out sound like it's the magic key you know it's the yeah. it's the magic bullet thing and it's the new thing and how much because i get questions how much do you make of this score well this was leaked we find out this is not all that it's cracked you know that it's the the context wasn't there whatever because like we saw recently that i guess cj stroud's scores were really low and the the c the co-founder went on the pat mcafee show and said listen the guy got in late the team made him take the test he was hungry it was late at night he was grumpy we told him we'd take it again when he was in a different time but that was part of a score wasn't even a complete thing it got leaked his next score was much higher okay fine if that's true fine but to me that long build up this question is is you know it hasn't been around a long time so like we don't know what correlates yet yep. so how do you where do you, how do you approach this thing as a as a person in your capacity well first i think it's interesting because the wonderlick and you and i've talked about it ad nauseum i mean to me all that is to me and that's been is a red flag indicator is yeah. if you get single digit score i just gotta find out why yeah i'm not saying it means you're dumb or smart but at least makes me do my homework and i'm fine with that if that's what it's for and that's what it does i'm fine with it as long as you don't make any other decisions or anything on it i think it's great to have a red flag indicator there's no no harm in that then there's another one i want to say it's called the hr2 or something which is a uh, an emotional intelligence test which teams have been using for about 15 18 years they do believe pretty strongly in it that it shows how guys will react to awkward bad situations how they'll recover i think there's value in that i love this new system um i think any way we can take something that is so undefinable 100 percent, and make it a little more definable i love it yeah. all that being said we got three or four years of data we don't even know who's going to be it took Geno Smith a decade to be good, Yeah. right? So to me, what I would do if I were a team and we were really looking at a quarterback and we got this S2 data, I'll tell you one thing. I would not only be using my scouts, my, my directors, I'd be having my quarterback coach, my offensive coordinator. I might even go get two or three former elite offensive minds to watch film and give me a grade. I don't want you to grade the player. Forget that. Just give me their, what you think of them mentally. Because if I get seven guys that I trust, and I'm not saying that the test isn't worth anything, but until we have years of data, I want to make sure that I have extra opinions on the mental so we can compare. Because then we can start to draw parallels. If we have six guys evaluate mental on all the quarterbacks, and they're starting to be a connection with, look, all six of these grades, the rankings are almost the same as with this test. Well, that, to me that i'd have that i'd feel good but if all of a sudden they're saying no our what we're showing is different now that doesn't mean i'm going to disregard that test but until there's more data for a longer period of time i can't say oh forget what they saw in film right we're just going with this test or forget what the test showed we're just going with the film you got to try to figure out why there's a differentiate why they show up as different so i think there's great value in it i am a believer of try everything because like one of the things I think is great, and I'd love to see the next step, they, they chart how much linebackers move versus play action. I think that's a great indicator to tell you about their instincts, their ability to read. Now the next step becomes, how do you determine which guys can be coached to react less? Yeah. Because if you can figure that out, then all of a sudden it's not just how are they reacting, but which ones can we improve and which coaches are best at teaching them not to bite on play action fake. So I'm all for any of these tests. I think the value is so tremendous because the more we can get out of the game, the emotion and the unknowing and make this more of a science than an art, I think it gives you a chance to be successful more. And you know what? As a, Even though I'm a scout and I grew up scouting, if I work for a team and we were winning – Super Bowls on a regular basis, like the Patriots were for all those years, I wouldn't care how we came to the opinion on the grades. If I was scouting for that team, 
I want to be a part of a team that's winning. Yeah. I don't want to be so stuck on it's got to be old school scouting and my team isn't paying attention to any new technology and we're winning five games a year. Yeah. I want to win. I want to put rings on my finger. Yeah. Yeah. And that's keeping it in perspective for sure. So let's let's end this this way. You know, you you saw something on Twitter um, this week talking about loving the game and players loving the game. And I'd love for you to end this show on that note to, to give your thoughts on this. Yeah, you know, and I did not want to get into a whole Twitter battle. I don't think you ever win anything on that. But someone yeah. made this statement basically saying, hey, if any player has played in college football and gotten to the point where they're realistically being in position to be a draft pick, that they shouldn't ever have the question come up of, do they love football? Because th th this person said they have to love it to get to this point. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is that's, it's sort, of, that's sort, of a, it's sort of a false belief. Because if you go into the nitty gritty, firstly, when guys get to college and they're playing college football, in, all of, in, in reality, it is a job. I mean, call it what you want, but it is basically a four, three, two-year job interview. Um, and the point of every job interview is to get to the highest level and to obviously make as much money, be as successful. But you have to find out which of these guys loves the game separate from what comes from the game. Because there are a lot of players that, and I'm not trying to kill players, there are some players who their only focus is getting to the NFL, getting that first paycheck. Other players' focus is getting to the NFL, making money. Other players focus on, yeah, I want to make money, I want to do it. But I want to be a great, I want to play for 15 years. I want to, and your job as a scout and then the executive and the coaches, and this is why teams interview players, is how much does it really matter? It really does matter because I can promise you there are players that will go in the first round Thursday that have gone in the first round in the past 15 years that do not love football. No. And anybody who tells you that they all love football to get drafted, they don't understand that the majority of players that fail in professional football fail due to intangibles. Now, it's not all not loving football. There's medical. There's not being able to learn. There's not instinctive. There's not tough. But part of it is the, the loving of football. And when I say loving football, I'm not talking about loving it on game day because that's part of it, the competing yeah. on game day. Loving getting up step. at 4 a.m. to work out, go to the facility. You're banged up. You don't know if you're even going to play. You're taped up, but you're still going to do the th the little things every day that you need to do to get better. Yep. It, it's Somebody always joked, they said, if your quarterback isn't the hardest working player on your team, you have very little chance of success because they. it's not about loving Every quarterback loves playing the game. That's not the hard part. It's watching hours of film to find one or two little things. A lot of it, and even if you ask the quarterbacks who love the process, they'll tell you there are times where it's boring to watch film because you're seeing the same thing over and over. You're not finding that thing you're looking for. So there is part of that, but you have to find guys who love that part of it, the preparation, what they want to be so good that it matters, that they're there on their days off. They're doing things that you shouldn't be doing in order to be successful. And that's where you can really tell. Like when you go to a school and you talk to them, they talk about how this is a guy that the coaches have to literally tell him to leave and lock the door because he won't go. He wants to watch more film. Or he's always bringing in teammates to watch film because he doesn't like the fact that even if he plays well, the offensive line doesn't because he's only one of five. So he drags the rest of them in to play yeah. or to watch film. Those are the types of things you see. And, and a perfect example, and, and, and I don't remember the player. I know, oh, I shouldn't say I don't remember. I don't want to share the player's name just because I never like to give stories out. But I remember particularly at the combine, I was walking with a player um, who ended up being a first-round pick and is still in the league. And I asked him because in his senior year, in the first game of the season, he got a knee injury. And initially, it was reported that he was out for the year. Um, it turned out it was just a cartilage, and he literally played the next week. Um, so he and I were walking, and he was explaining how he hurt it Saturday, got swelled up. Sunday, they were able to do an MRI. Monday, he got it scoped. Tuesday, he was in a brace. Wednesday, he was walking around. Thursday, he was able to hobble through practice. Friday, he practiced fully, and Saturday, he played. And we were doing this walk. And there was a woman reporter with us, very knowledgeable, very smart woman, um, 
who asked, I thought, a great question. And she goes, she goes, well, when you do something like this, didn't you think you, you were putting your career in jeopardy with your knee? And his response was, there was no ligament damage, so I knew it was just pain. And I'm an offensive lineman, so I'm not worried about pain. I have to be out there for my teammates. And when you hear a say, someone say that, it tells you that they were smart enough to think about the long-term ramifications because they knew about the ligaments. But they were also such a teammate and so tough and so want to see the team succeed that they weren't worried about the pain or the uncomfortable part of playing as long as it wasn't going to do further damage. They were ready to go. Yeah. And to me, that's part of loving ball. It's not just loving the games. It's you want to be there for your teammates. You want to be in the locker room. You want to be a part of helping a team succeed. Yeah. Think about, I remember the story Dan Shanka told about Peyton Manning, about seeing Peyton Manning in the in the bowels of the University of Tennessee Stadium late at night in the weight room. He had just finished watching tape and he was allowed to stay there late and it was like late at night and he came walking out and, and it was in the weight room and he could see just a little light in the in the back of the weight room and there was Peyton Manning practicing his drop footwork by himself. You know, and then another story I saw this week where I think it was Bill Polian talking about the difference between his inter his club interview with Peyton, a club visit with Peyton Manning and Ryan Leaf. And he said that at the time, you know, Peyton Manning came in with a briefcase and a notepad, sat down and said, hey, can I ask you guys some questions? And before we get started, he said, yeah. And Manning had a whole list of questions that he asked them. And it took up the entire lot of time of the interview. And and they and the only question they got to ask, and, and he said, oh, Peyton asked it. They, they wanted to ask him about when he could come in to start, you know, after the draft. But Manning apparently said, asked one of the questions, he said, well, I know that the the rules are that I can't come in before, you know, Oh, Three, before graduation. Yeah, yeah, before whatever day it is after the draft. I can't come in, but I'm going to be here. So I just want to know, um, how do I get in? Because I'm going to be here. Like, I need I need to be in here to do what I'm doing. And then he goes, well, Peyton, we only... He goes, I don't care. I'm going to be here. So are you going to be... Is someone going to be able to let me in? You don't have to yeah. know. I just need to know. And he said, you know, and we got up and we were like, wow. You know, I mean, he interviewed us. And, and that tells you right there. Ownership, what caring, investment, yep. you know. Exactly. And, you know, details. Think, you know, also just like, I love this so much. I don't care what the rules are. I'm willing to do whatever it takes because I need to do this. Like this is, I'm if I have to camp out in the parking lot, can you at least give me X, Y, and Z to do? Whereas in yep. contrast, they they interviewed Ryan Leaf after that. Not long after that, and they asked him about when he planned to show me. He goes, well, you know, my friends and I planned this trip to Vegas like months in advance. And, you know, I'm really not going to be able to make it at least until like eight days after the, the initial report time. And he said that told us volumes when we looked at the players and started looking at all the other things. That, but that stood out because it underscored everything else they saw. Yeah, it, it's really interesting. I think the thing that I always try to look at, and and, and it's hard to 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 judge um, when you're not a part of it, like yeah. the, what people say and stuff. But I always just try to look at it when I talk to coaches and when I talk to people around the player, just to get a feel for how important is it. Like, what are they like on an everyday basis? And I try to talk to the people who can't influence the especially in college, they can't influence the playing time. The equipment guys, trainers, the video guys, like even if the player is a schmuck to the equipment guy or he's great to the equipment guy, the coach isn't going to change where he plays. It yeah. doesn't matter to him. He just wants him to play. So when you hear the equipment guys and the trainers and those people talk about how committed these guys are and how much they work or the opposite, hey, they don't even show up in time to get the right pads. Sometimes they grab the wrong shoes when they go out to practice, things like that little things start start to tell a story. And when you hear the same thing about it's not that important, you sometimes will hear, hey, this kid, they'll even tell you sometimes, we're pretty sure the kid doesn't even like 
football, he's doing this because he's a great athlete. It was his way to get to college, and his family is really pushing this. Well, if you hear that, alarm bells should be going off because the NFL, it's not just like a nine-to-five job yeah. where you just have to show up, check in, everything's fine. Your body gets beaten up. Your emotions get destroyed. You have to have a lot of intestinal fortitude yeah. to survive long term. And if you don't love that, if I just try to think of it in the grander scheme of how many times do you work in a job? And you know there are people that don't love it. They're, they're doing yep. the same job. They're in your same company. Well, guess what? The NFL, same thing. There are going to be people who don't like being there. That's right. Whether it's on the personnel side, the coaching, or the players. Yeah. And on the personnel and coaching, they might be able to hide it and get away with it. But for players, it's exposed when they're in a game. Yeah. So you have to try to figure that out. For anybody to say that there are players that, that because they get, they're in the position to be drafted because they play college football, that they all love it, it's not true. Yeah, it's a great point, Russ, because it's – and sometimes you don't even know at that age whether you truly love it until exactly. you get in there in that environment. It's the same story like you told about your – about a friend or someone you met and said, hey, I really love football. I oh, really yeah. want to get yeah. into scouting. Well, come on over to my house. And you told that great story about by noon that you were going to done. get the sandwich. Yeah. And he was he's like, you know, I don't love it. I'm done. It's the, you know, it's like saying, oh, I love chocolate chip cookies. And then going, okay, we're well, going to eat a plate of chocolate chip cookies every day, three meals a day. You know, yep. are you going to I mean, love it just, after just that? Just look at Joe Thomas or any of these guys now. The yeah. way 210 pounds. Yeah. Think about the level. Russell Oakham. Of, of Russell Oakham. Think about how uncomfortable they were for 20 years of their life eating to the point where you know it wasn't comfortable. Yeah. But they knew that was what they needed to do to be successful. Yeah. It, it just people have no grasp of. Yes, I, I'm sure every player in college, there's something about the experience they like. But that doesn't mean they love the grind. You right. have to, and Drew Brees talked about it. You have to love the grind if you're going to be successful on game day. And yeah. that's what I think a lot of players don't love. Yeah. And there's always exceptions to that rule. No of doubt. Folks who don't have to, but th those exceptions, you can count probably on one hand every 10 years at each position. And you probably can cut the digits in half that you can count on one hand that do that. And that's not. That's not going to help you as a scout. No, you know, and I and I should add out. the other part of this that for some reason I, we both forgot to mention, which yeah. a lot of these guys are so gifted that in college they're so much better athletically than the majority of the players are going against. Yeah. Even at the Alabamas and Georgias, the bulk of players at Alabama and Georgia are not going to be in the NFL long term. Yep. They may get a cup of coffee, but most of them are going to be gone. So the bulk of these guys that get there, there are some – that can produce and be competitive and productive players good enough to get drafted without putting in the time and effort. Yeah. But when they get to the NFL, almost everybody's equivalent talent wise. There's yeah. little variations, but overall the talent level is so much greater than Alabama, Georgia, that if you don't do the work, everybody's going to pass you because you're not going to be productive enough. And that's one of the things I think people forget. You get to the NFL. It's not like you're at the same level. It's a whole different level of talent. And you can't just coast by anymore on your physical God-given athletic traits. Yeah, you know, we could go on and on with this yes. discussion because I and I and I would love to, but I know that this is, we you know, we're probably at the point where we probably should wrap it up. But it's a you know, it's always this was a fascinating conversation that I think covered a lot of ground with the NFL draft coming up that. Uh, you know, if you really wanted to dive in from a board building scouting angle, this was this was it for sure. Um, I'm thinking maybe next year, you, me, and we try to get some other people that are in this business. Maybe we set up and go to a hotel and do a few days where we would actually sort of show you guys sort of the methodology yeah. and sort of maybe video it. Yeah, and we can edit it out and sort of put that out there as little things about how a board gets built. I like that idea. I like that idea. We should talk, definitely talk yeah. about that more. I that think would be, be exciting. Fun. I think people would enjoy seeing the actual process. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. I would definitely enjoy seeing it. That's for sure. Well, listen, you know, you can follow Russ Landy at Russ Landy on Twitter. Find me at Matt Waldman on Twitter. Rookie Scouting Portfolio. I'm getting the post draft 
set up so that it'll be ready to deliver the analysis within no later than a week after the NFL draft. You'll get a cheat sheet probably emailed to you that's a preliminary one two to three days after the after the um, last day of the draft. Um, and so, you know, if you're a fantasy player, you'll definitely love that. Um, and if you're just a football fan in general, look, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, you can get it at mattwaldman.com, 150 scouting reports on players, probably the most comprehensive look at those players that you will see in, in media scouting available. Not probably, 100% of it. There's <laughs> no doubt. If you want to know what it's like to really scout and evaluate, get the RSP. There's nothing like it. I tell you people, Matt could be scouting in the NFL if he chose and be better than most of the scouts because his attention to detail is process. He would be a rock star, except they wouldn't let him in the schools overnight to scout. So he'd have to rearrange his schedule, but it would all work out. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, we, you know, I, I worked at a university. I might be able to finagle my way to get a couple of keys. You might. Somewhere. He had a few schools. Yes, yeah, no doubt. A few schools, <laughs> maybe. You know, but um, I don't know about Georgia anymore. But we'll see. Thanks again, folks, and we will see you in a couple weeks.